um, first of all, I've been doing this 16 years. I started, uh, I guess, 95, somewhere around, and I started working for the Pine Bluff Commercial. That was my first job, and I was covering sports then, and they switched me over. And um, when I, um, after I started covering courts, and I was talking to Ronald a little earlier, I'm not going to go into detail about this case, but I had basically trial by fire the first one. It was a very unique case. Fortunately, I had a mentor. So if you go into journalism, the best thing to do is find you a mentor, someone that you can call on who's been there before. Okay. Now, while I still have your attention, <laughs> I want to say three words. These are the most important things, in my opinion, to remember. These three words, honesty, integrity, and enthusiasm. If you tackle each story with those things, uh, you'll build a good reputation and you'll keep it. But just keep those three things in mind. They're, they're just very, very important. Sometimes it's difficult not to, you're going to form an opinion on things. There's no question about it. You can't help it. We're human. But keep it out of your stories. Just keep it out uh, at all costs. Be careful about public statements too. Especially today with social media, Twitter, be careful what you say. Because those things have a way of coming back and biting you. They really do. Uh, it's not, uh, I don't mean to say you can't talk about what you're covering. Just be careful that you don't take sides or anyone knows what your side is. Um, it's also important to attack each story with an open mind. Um, I've heard reporters ask editors, what angle do you want me to take on this story? Bad question. You, you don't take an angle. You go in there with an open mind and you'll get a good story. Don't look at it from an angle and don't go into it with any preconceived notions. Um, now, a little bit about covering courts. At most newspapers, the cops reporter and the court reporter is the same person. So you'll be able to cover a case from the very beginning to the very end, from the time somebody's arrested until they're either acquitted or the final appeal if, if it goes, if it gets the, you know, if they're convicted, or an execution. I've covered an execution. I'll, it's not fun to watch somebody die. But, you know. Now, let me uh, tell you a little bit about that particular one, the execution. And I'll kind of give it as an example from beginning to end. Uh, this case began in 1998 when a 28-year-old man was arrested for shooting five people. This happened in Lincoln County. He shot his girlfriend, his girlfriend's cousin, the girlfriend's cousin's two small children. We're talking five and seven years old, I believe. Uh, and a 12-year-old babysitter. His defense was that he was in some kind of drug-induced stupor or something. Well, he was convicted. This case was unique in that he did not appeal it. He waived all his rights to appeal. Um, he started writing letters to the victim's families before his execution, saying that he was not going to appeal unless they asked him to do so. They didn't. So, as far as uh, coverage, shortly, and I, the trial was just normal covering of the trial and basically regurgitating what's happening in an interview. Um, shortly before the execution date, uh, because he was saying that he was not that he was not going to appeal it. Uh, I interviewed the victim's families to see if they planned to ask him to go through the appeals process. And uh, I also requested an interview with him. Uh, he denied it, but the families agreed to it. And um, those stories from those interviews were the pre-execution, I say pre-execution package, because that sounds so cold, but that's what it was. It was a pre-execution package that the paper did leading up to the actual execution. Um, then, but something important about interviews like that, it's important to show compassion to those people. 
but be real careful about how you do it and what you say. I think it's best to use it with facial, uh, show compassion through facial expressions or maybe nods rather than words. Because as I said, words have a way of coming back to bite you later. And you just, it's just not a good idea. Um, the, uh, I like to think of reporters as the proverbial fly on the wall. Don't get involved in your stories. Don't become a news item. Stay out of them. Uh, you are to report the news, not make it. And many reporters turn themselves into such, they become news items themselves, of their own doing. Now, I did have one time, it wasn't my choice, but uh, I became a part of a, a trial. Uh, are y'all familiar have y'all heard about the Osborne case? I'm from McGee. Okay. Mm -hmm. the I, I was graduated with this son. Okay. I had to testify in that trial. I was covering it. And what had happened was uh, there was supposed to be a press conference. I got wind of one or something was going to be happening. So I went to the law enforcement training center over there or that law enforcement, I can't remember, it's not training center, but whatever that is, the law enforcement thing is on Highway 65, I think. And uh, there was no one there. So I went inside, parked my car, went inside, and sat in the lobby waiting for somebody to get there because something was supposed to happen. And while I was in there, I heard what sounded like vomiting, the sound of vomiting and crying. It was in another room. I was in the lobby area. So I'm listening. And uh, a little while later, uh, a woman and a young boy come in and sit down in the lobby. And then a few minutes after that, a girl comes down the hallway. And she's obviously, she has tear-stained eyes, and she says, they're going to try to get me too. And uh, so I learned later who that girl was. Then they had the press conference. And I asked the uh, sheriff who was conducting the press conference who that, um, if it was, it was the Osborne's daughter, is who the girl was. Uh, I asked him if uh, the sheriff, if she was in trouble, and he said, not that I know of. And that was the end of it. So I go back to the newspaper, I do my story, and the defense attorney calls. And he wants my notes. I said, I don't have any notes, uh, which is true. I destroy my notes after I do a story. Uh, they can't be subpoenaed if they don't exist. And some people keep their notes, but I don't think it's a good practice. Get rid of them, and they can't be subpoenaed. I said, all you have is, uh, I said, I don't have any notes. All I know is what I wrote in my story, and you know, you have every right to that. They wanted me to testify. Of course, I didn't want to do that. I did everything in the world I could to get out of that, and the newspaper even hired an attorney to try to get me out of it, but I had to testify. So the point is, do your job, but try your best to stay out of the news stories. Now, that wasn't my fault. I was doing my job. But some people, they actually insert themselves into it. They, they think they're a star. You're not a star. You're a fly on the wall. Um, now, a little bit about uh, trial coverage. Um, the most important thing you can do in covering a trial is be prepared research before the trial. Don't go into it cold. Know who the players are. Let me give you something. Take a look at this. Uh, this is uh, something I did actually prior to the Osborne trial. And uh, it shows, uh, it's just a pre-trial story uh, and it explains the case who the people are that are involved, the victim, the suspect, the prosecutor, defense attorney, and the judge, and just a little bio on each one of them, and a little background on the case. Now, if, um, if you're prepared, and you know who everybody is, you know what the charge, and it's more than just knowing the charge. Try to get the defense aside of too, which is not easy, because a lot of times defense attorneys, they won't talk. But, 
there are things that go on in court prior to the trial that you can learn a lot about the defensive side. You know, motions that are filed or uh, particularly the pretrial. Uh, there's a, a lot of things that will happen during pretrial where you can learn the defensive side of the case. Uh, we often get criticized in, in the media for being slanted toward the prosecution. That's not true. Uh, uh, well, in most cases, it's not true. The problem is you get more information from that side than you get from the other side, and you can only report what you know. So going to pretrials are, is very important to get the other side, and checking to see what motions are filed in court prior to trial, that's where you can get the other side a lot of times. Now, um, when court is in session, and I, I don't know how much you already know, and I apologize if I'm talking down or anything, because I don't mean to, I just don't know what you already know, but when court is in session, all you can do is observe. Uh, the parties are, they don't have to answer any questions, they're not required to do that. Uh, you know, you can ask the prosecutor for an interview, you can ask anybody. They don't have to do it. It's up to them whether they want to or not. A lot of times they will, but they don't have to. So don't go into it and be argumentative and, and battle, uh, get into some kind of battle with them because they won't talk to you. They don't have to. But you can get pretty much everything you want during the trial anyway. Um, I think a good court reporter is part historian. Uh, part critic, transcriber, uh, observer, and always a good listener. Always listen. And it's tough sometimes, especially when you have a long testimony about DNA or a chain of command of evidence. That is the most boring. And your mind will wander. Try to keep it from wandering because every once in a while something very important will be uttered during that testimony. Just, it's hard to do sometimes. I mean, I've fallen asleep before I did it, but um, it's try not to. Um, let's see. Um, now, another thing, vocabulary. It's a good idea to expand your vocabulary to have um, different words for crude remarks, or crude words, especially in covering a rape trial, because witnesses will use some of the most crude words, and especially if you live in the Bible Belt, uh, you just don't want to use those words. So try to find a, a palatable way to convey what they said without using crude words, and I'll give you an example, I'm not going to mention crude words, but uh, there was a case, a rape case, uh, that I covered, and uh, it was a young victim, and uh, he used some extremely crude words, but he had to describe it the way he could. The judge, uh, well, he was required to say what happened to him, but he, used it, he did it in a way that he could. You don't have to use his words. Uh, I knew ahead of time that there was going to be junior high and high school students reading these stories because they knew the victim and they knew the, the suspect. And so keep that in mind, who your readers are when you're writing. You know, you may have a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old, you know, maybe not that young, but you're going to have young people reading your stories and think about them when you're wording. Don't go for sensationalism or... That's, I don't like that. I don't like that. You are reporting what's happening and trying to basically educate people as well. Uh, but you don't have to do it in a crude way. And sometimes reporters do that because, you know, big headlines and uh, generate traffic to their website or whatever. Uh, be respectable. Um, and uh, then the last thing uh, is interviewing. The most important thing to do when interviewing is listen. Of course, you need to know the right questions to ask, and you're going to know that from researching the case ahead of time. But listen to their response. 
Don't think about what your next question is going to be. Really listen to them. Because a lot of times their response is going to give you another question that you hadn't thought about anyway. So that's listening is extremely important. Now, do you have any questions? Well, actually coming off of that, after you ask everything, <clears throat> and let's say that's the perfect of having a recorder now, modern technology, but like you're writing down your notes, it's always good to write and be able to record, hopefully. You know, not letting it be right in front of them so they're like tempted or whatever. But um, if you're able to just like, oh, well, they just made me think of a question I didn't even think to ask because exactly. of what they said. So exactly. would it be a good idea to like, okay, flip the page, write a question right quick, go back and start writing again because you already have the recorder there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you might have missed a couple things if you still got the recorders back up. But I mean, would that be worth doing because you want to make sure you get every little tidbit? That's not a bad idea at all. Okay. That's not a bad idea. Because I've always idea. wondered about that. that I don't think that's a bad idea. I usually, if it's something that I'm really cold on, on an issue, and I don't mean necessarily courts because I cover a lot more than courts, but if it's something that I'm very unfamiliar with, I read as much as I can about that particular issue before I go into the interview, and I generally have more <coughs> questions up front on that issue than I would something like a trial story because I'm more familiar with with those type things. But if it's a, uh, oh gosh, sometimes in, I've interviewed university professors about, you know, science things, which I'm not really good with that sort of thing. And I'll have a lot more questions. Um, and I make sure, and another thing, is make sure you have plenty of upfront questions because some people, well, one word responses, uh, yep. that's hard. That's really, really hard. Yeah. Uh, so make sure you have plenty of them and if you don't understand something or if they answer you and you do not understand their response, tell them you don't. Ask them to explain it to you. Uh, tell them what you don't understand about it. Don't be afraid to appear dumb. I mean, don't. Because you can't convey to the public what you've, what you've learned. You can't write your story unless you understand it. You have to understand it to be able to write about it. So that basically, I guess, implies the conversational part of the interview where sure, like, sure. You're, you're just asking the question and the answer. So, but then you're like, okay, now I want to get you, I want to ask if you can explain these things because I'm discuss that. Like, it doesn't mean this, it mean that. Do you have to be suggestive or do you just ask them to explain it? Ask them. I just ask, ask them. them, okay. It's just, uh, and, and it wouldn't be a bad idea if you don't understand say, something, say, Tell them, you know, I don't understand this. I have to write about this, and I have to convey it in a way, but I cannot convey that or write about it unless I understand it. Can you help me understand, you know, you know, DNA or whatever it is? Uh, or you can even ask them, can you give me an example? You know, that sort of thing. Uh, whatever it takes for you to understand the issue, because you can't write about it if you don't understand it. You just can't do it. And uh, so I, I don't mind asking questions at all. In fact, I probably ask too many. <laughs> but, uh, and I don't mind appearing dumb either, you know. So anyway, any other questions? Um, about the, the cruel words <laughs> or whatever, um, how do you go about doing that? But if you're wanting to quote the witness, you know, and you're changing there, do you just use what, that in a non-quote way? Or? If you want to quote them, and they use a particularly crude word, what I do, if let's say that they use um, the F word, uh, you don't want to use that, but you want to quote what they've said. All you need to do, put your quote in there, in parentheses, where the F word, or whatever that word is, uh, just put... Uh, Let's see. Um, uh, expletive deleted, and your reader is going to know probably what they said, uh, and that's for one word. You will find cases probably where someone will describe something that happened to them, um, rather than go into a whole lot of detail about specifics. A lot of times I'll say, well, you know, 
he took her into the bedroom and attacked her or something like that. Uh, you do not have to put in your story what sodomize is. I mean, so, you know, the word sodomy is fine, but you do not have to describe it. And chances are a witness sometimes will describe it specifically, exactly what happened to him. He sodomized her. You know, you see what I'm saying? Be real careful about those crude words.